Fantastic. Thank you, Pete. Okay. okay. So I'm not one for text. You probably saw a little bit of sneak peek of my slides there. Uh, it's all going to be pictures. It's my, my story in pictures. Uh, so uh, I got into the Cardano uh, ecosystem probably about 2018. Um, obviously, hadn't been around for very long. Uh, people were uh, getting excited about blockchain, obviously, with the, the hype in 2017. And uh, Cardano came along and it kind of struck a, a, a nerve with me as far as uh, the, the philosophy and uh, how um, it was being built. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with uh, a, a few images that are AI generated. So this next one is not actually me. <laughs> uh, I asked AI to create a, a graduation of someone graduating from their computer science degree. So why have I, why have I added this to my journey for Cardano? Because I graduated quite a long time ago from university. Um, the reason why I've included it is because it actually shaped my decision about why Cardano. Um, obviously, having a technical background and uh, understanding how Cardano is actually being built from a research up um, approach um, was one of the things that I really appreciated. Um, I was speaking to somebody before um, today, uh, uh, just down in the foyer, and they asked this question, why, why Cardano? And one of the things that uh, I really resonated with me was the idea that um, it's being built uh, slowly and methodically because at the end of the day it's going to hold millions or billions of dollars worth of people's value. Other blockchains obviously are more interested in being uh, first to market so they want to get that network effect uh, and that's obviously an important area of a lot of products is to get that network share um, but if that's at the expense of building it reliably and making sure that uh, there's not going to be any problems then uh, that's not a trade-off that I think uh, I was prepared to make. So um, that's kind of the why I chose Cardano, um, which I think is, is probably a similar story to a lot of other people. Um, certainly people I've spoken to have said the same thing about why they felt uh, Cardano was the right fit for them. Any idea what this is supposed to represent? Mining? Any, anything in particular, a particular type of mining? Fiat mining. fiat mining. I love this term, fiat mining. So out of university, I've got 20 to 25 years worth of experience in the uh, non-blockchain space. Uh, and I love this idea that um, in the non-blockchain space, we're, we're mining for fiat and how that's perceived by a lot of people as a bad thing. And maybe fiat money does have its problems. But at the end of the day, I really valued the experience that I've, I've got over those 20 plus years. Um, it's actually helped um, me uh, get an appreciation for technology solutions and uh, how to then build on top of blockchain, uh, which is obviously the next step of my journey. So um, I did my time in the mines uh, before coming to Cardano in 2018. This was my first experience on Cardano. Does anybody know what that is? No, no, no takers. So in the very early days of Cardano, before um, the node launched, there was something called Yorgamanda, which is what this snake's called. And it was the, the test net for the node prior to the incentivized test net. So this was my first attempt at doing something in the Cardano ecosystem, was get, jump, jumping on the Telegram channel, um, speaking to people about how do we get this node up and running. And it was pretty difficult, <laughs> I must say. A lot of challenges, a lot of things didn't go right, but um, this gave me my first exposure to the community of Cardano, which is um, obviously, we're all here today, we're all part of that community. Um, but I really uh, felt a strong connection with the people and what they were trying to build and how everybody was working together to help each other. So, the, the next thing that came after the Yorgamanda testnet was the incentivized testnet. And so 
I ask myself, is this something that I want to do? Do I want to jump in and go to that next level? And while I did have some experience uh, throughout my career with uh, implementing and managing server infrastructure, um, it wasn't something that was kind of my main area of focus. I have been more involved of, uh, in recent years in solution design and software architecture. So uh, I kind of also realized that there was a marketing element to it, which Pete probably can attest to, <laughs> that uh, operating a node uh, and being able to attract stake is uh, something that's less about the technical side of things and more about the marketing side of things. So I made the decision at the time not to continue with the incentivized testnet, um, but did really appreciate this time um, and my exposure to the early stages of, of Cardano. This was the next thing that came along that really caught my attention. Is everybody familiar with Project Catalyst? Anybody who's not? Okay. So Project Catalyst is essentially a, uh, a fund of money that comes from the treasury from the blockchain. Every time a transaction is performed on the Cardano blockchain, a little bit of the money is set aside in fees. Some of that goes to pay the, uh, the node operators. Some of it actually gets put into a treasury. And I think at last count there was over a billion ADA in this treasury. So um, Project Catalyst came along and the idea was that people would apply for um, essentially grants um, to fund projects that they wanted to build on top of Cardano. And I thought, this is fantastic, this is perfect, exactly what I need to be able to actually start doing something for real on this blockchain. So uh, this is my first attempt at um, get, getting some funds from the, the Catalyst um, project. And so just to, to let you know, the way that the Catalyst project works is that um, people put forward their proposal and ADA holders actually vote for which projects they want to get funded. So if you hold ADA, you have the ability to vote for Catalyst projects. And so I do encourage everybody to do that because it's a super important part of our ecosystem. So this is fun too. This is in the very early stages of, of Catalyst. Um, and everybody was still working out how to actually properly uh, interact with the community and how to actually get attention for their projects. Uh, this wasn't successful. So I went into fund three, another attempt. Um, so the first one was with, a, with somebody else called uh, Steve. This one was by myself. Um, I thought, if anyone familiar with Ada Handles as a project? Yep. So something similar to that. Essentially, uh, a, a, an easy name resolution for complex addresses. Uh, so fund three, I gave it another crack. Still no success. Fund four. Well, may as well put the same proposal in, just tweak it a little bit, take feedback from people as to why it wasn't uh, attractive in the previous fund. Unfortunately, still no success again. Fund five, I joined a group called NFT DAO. Again, so many different uh, Cardano community groups that come together um, with different interests. Uh, NFT DAO were uh, initially trying to propose uh, standards and infrastructure to support people who wanted to create NFT projects on Cardano. Um, so this was my offering into that project, unfortunately not successful again. So four attempts at Catalyst funding and thumbs down every time, unfortunately. So I'm still trying, okay, I'm still trying to give it a go, I'm still trying to get something off the ground in Cardano, I still believe in the mission, I want to build something of value that will contribute. So this is the Cardano Forum, and this is actually the, uh, the genesis, if you like, of the Empower project. So this is where I met my co-founder, Glenn. Uh, you can see the date's February 21, 20, uh, uh, 2021. And this is literally all he posted. So I've responded to him. Um, he's obviously wanting to know whether this Cardano blockchain thing can support um, the problem statement that he said about trying to address the uh, affordable housing problem in Africa. So Glenn's uh, Zimbabwean originally, lived in South Africa, um, so he has a, a personal connection to the problem in Africa. Um, so I reached out to him, I said, I feel I can you know, help out here, I've been around Cardano a while, I've got a good understanding as to how it works and what, it, what we can do um, within Cardano. And so we got to talking and ideating and trying to work out 
um, how could we actually address this problem? And before we know it, we've written a white paper. <laughs> okay, so um, this is fantastic, um, but a, a white paper is one thing. It's whether people will actually um, embrace the ideas in the white paper. Uh, so we started circulating this to a few different people. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to get the support of somebody called John O'Connor. He's uh, the director for African operations for IOG, who IOG are the company that are building the Cardano blockchain. And he put us in touch with a few people who he thought might be interested in this. And sure enough, you know, we were able to get a few um, private investors to kickstart the project. Fantastic, we're off and running. Um, so we started to um, build a team, um, people who uh, can contribute to uh, the marketing side of things, to the technical side of things, um, and starting to flesh this out a little bit more than just a white paper into something um, that we can actually start to deliver to people. So we decided to go back to Catalyst. Okay. I've had four attempts without any success, okay? but we've, I've now got a team behind me. Okay? I've now got a team who can um, know how to present um, project ideas. I'm a technical guy, I'm not a marketing guy. So um, we, we've brought specialists in like uh, Greg, our chief operating officer, got a background in marketing, um, knows how to put um, things together uh, from a wording perspective. Um, Hung, our uh, creative director, creating these beautiful designs for concepts that we can also put forward. And obviously, uh, in Fund 5, there was a challenge called Grow Africa, Grow Cardano. Perfect fit for our, our um, project. And so um, we submitted our proposal, and don't you know it? We get funded. We sneak in by the smallest of margins. Okay, We just pip out another project called WADA. I don't know if anyone's familiar with WADA as a, as a project. We just scraped them out. So um, this is fantastic because not only do we now have um, some funding to be able to continue building, but we're also starting to build a community as well. And that's probably the most important thing that you can do as part, as part of building a project on Cardano is to start to build a community around your project. So one of the things that we um, offered to do as part of that Catalyst proposal was two things. One was to um, demonstrate that we could actually work with a partner on the ground, that we could get funds to them, that we could actually build a house and deliver a house. Okay? Pretty important for, obviously, providing affordable housing. Um, but the other side of that was that the, the, uh, the way that we were proposing to fund houses in Africa was using the sale of NFTs. So we also needed to prove that we could actually deliver NFTs. So, this video represents our first attempt at that. So we created an NFT series called our Founding Community NFTs. It was a set of 1,024, and as you can see, this is like a grid. Every, uh, every uh, rectangle on this grid is one of the NFTs, and collectively they're made up uh, a, a canvas that our creative director created. <clears throat> so I'll just play that again in case you missed it. Um, so each one of those represents a different NFT and they collectively made that image. So, fantastic, we sold these NFTs out. Um, we've got more of a community, more people engaged. Um, we've uh, suggested to people that these NFTs will um, give them additional value throughout the rest of our project and hopefully that's something that we've honored. Um, by giving people early opportunities if they're a holder of these NFTs to some of the other things that we've uh, worked on. <clears throat> so this is quite early in the, in the days when uh, NFTs had only just um, become a thing in Cardano and uh, one of the tools that we took advantage of to be able to do this is a, a platform called NMaker. And I can't recommend them enough. They're absolutely fantastic. Their product has grown and evolved as um, the Cardano ecosystem has grown. Um, this one was in the very early stages and it was a little bit clunkier when we were um, working with this. Um, but our most recent NFT um, drop that we just did is 
uh, our experience in working with NMaker has just improved vastly over that, that time frame. So um, if anybody is working on an NFT project and you want to get something up and going, NMaker is the platform. Um, I couldn't recommend them more. Uh, am I not? Okay, so the next step is uh, we wanted to go beyond just this uh, seed of a community and actually do some serious fundraising. So we've, we've proven that we can deliver NFTs, we've proven that we can deliver housing. It's now time to step up and, and take it to the next level. Okay, so we uh, need to do some fundraising to actually build our platform out uh, more. We can actually um, deliver um, at scale rather than just a one at a time. So the first thing we did was uh, we ran an ISPO. Is anybody familiar with the term ISPO? Yeah. So for those that are not, it essentially allows um, people to delegate their ADA to uh, a, a state pool operator. And instead of getting ADA as a return, so um, 3 4% per annum is the kind of the standard return that you would get from uh, delegating your ADA, um, you forfeit all of that. And in return, um, we would give you our token as a, a replacement for that. So the money that that stake pool is actually earning is coming directly to our project instead of it being paid back to you. And in, in exchange for that, we're offering you the, the token that we're going to be using as part of our platform. And so, um, so we had to build a tool to actually show people how much they were earning. So this is a calculator that we, our development team created where people could put in their address and uh, it would tell them how much um, they had delegated to our stake pool and in return for that, how much um, of our EMP token they had earned. So he here is a, the first example of where that previous NFT has come into value because the founding community uh, NFT holders were being given a boost on this um, return. So in this example here, this particular wallet had a premium NFT, which meant that they would, would, would get a boost from the standard rate of EMP. Um, so continuing to try and uh, contribute back to the community that we're, we're building and offering utility for the different uh, tools that we're, um, we're building. And then we came to our token sale. Okay. <laughs> So this was, this was an interesting one. We decided that instead of using a launch pad, and there were a few that were starting to um, come together on the, in the Cardano ecosystem, but there were a lot of conditions around some of these launch pads where uh, you had to hold the launch pad's token to be able to participate in the early rounds or there was a minimum amount that you had to uh, commit to purchasing. And so we, we were about um, empowering communities and giving access to as many people as possible. So we didn't want people to be excluded from our token sale. Um, so we wanted to be as inclusive as possible. And so the only way that we felt that we could honestly do this was to actually build our own um, uh, uh, sale platform. Challenging at the time, um, the tech around Cardano was still very early. We didn't have wallet connectors, for example. Um, that we do now where you can go to a website, you can link your wallet and interact with the website using that connector. So we actually had to build our own mechanism for connecting your wallet um, to our dashboard, which meant sending a transaction to prove that you um, own the wallet. <clears throat> so this is an example of uh, the mechanism that we introduced around splitting it across multiple rounds. Again, we didn't want whales to come in and just take all the purchases all in one go. So we were limiting how much people could get access to round by round. And obviously, if we didn't sell out, then we would open it up at the end. Um, this, this was interesting. Uh, working with uh, KYC, obviously, as part of doing a token sale, um, we wanted to uh, make sure that we were following regulation, um, being compliant. So uh, we partnered with a, a KYC provider called BlockPass. We also made the decision, much to our communities, discuss that we were going to exclude the US <laughs> from participating in our token sale for probably obvious reasons to most people. 
Um, and then obviously other excluded areas as well. But um, if anybody's uh, running a project where they need to do some kind of KYC as part of their project, then BlockPass are a fantastic partner to work with. So great, okay, we've built this, this uh, portal for people to um, participate in our token sale. Um, you know, in, in hindsight, it was probably a little bit more work than we originally anticipated. However, the day of the first round comes along and we just get smashed. We get absolutely smashed. Our, our infrastructure provider can't take the load for the number of requests that we're getting, which is a nice problem to have, obviously, the fact that we're, being pop that we're popular. But obviously, that does uh, cause some concern for some people, the fact that they're uh, not able to get access or that the uh, system isn't operating the way that you think, especially when people are sending funds. Um, it's the last thing you want is uh, some message that something's gone wrong when you've just sent some funds. So, uh, you know, cert when, certainly not the, the, the first project to have experienced these kind of problems, um, but it's certainly not something that you want, especially when you're trying to establish trust um, with your community. So this was a great experience, um, and uh, certainly we learned a lot from this, um, but it was probably the most challenging <laughs> part of the project to date, I must say. So we're now into 2022 and uh, we've raised funds, um, we've started building, uh, started building our platform and uh, we're ready to do our first pilot, um, actually raising funds for um, houses in Mozambique with <clears throat> the same partner that we did the proof of concept with, uh, Casarael. So uh, the pilot was for 30 homes in Beira, in Mozambique. And the idea is, is that we will sell these NFTs to fundraise um, for those houses. So we were fortunate enough to be able to partner with uh, another project called World Mobile, um, who some might have heard of recently just launched an Aerostat in Mozambique. So um, kind of things have come full circle a little bit. But um, they're essentially providing mobile services um, to different parts of the world and uh, the housing um, partner that we were working with, uh, World Mobile, made a commitment to actually provide internet to those houses as well. So when people were contributing to this pilot um, by purchasing NFTs to fund these homes, they were, weren't only providing affordable housing, but they were also contributing to affordable internet for those people as well. So uh, this was reasonably successful as, a, as an NFT sale and a fundraising. Um, but we were starting to hit the bear market, okay? We were starting to see the early signs of the bear market, so it was starting to get a little bit challenging. Um, we fortunately had an underwriter, so any that we didn't sell uh, to the general public um, were gonna be uh, swept up by that underwriter. So this, is a, uh, this video was uh, the animation that was part of the NFT, and we, we wanted to test as part of this um, pilot not only would people be interested in uh, the purchase of the NFT to be able to contribute from a financial perspective, but also whether we could add some kind of intrinsic value into the NFT. Obviously, a lot of NFT projects to date are mainly selling intrinsic value, like a piece of art or something like that. So um, we wanted to see if that would be a motivating factor as well as, obviously, the financial contribution. So this was, again, uh, Hung, our creative director, created this... Um, beautiful animation that kind of represented this seed um, that was kind of the launching of our project. So, what kind of, of impact, I guess the, the next question is, is this project having? Obviously, I've explained that we're um, funding affordable housing um, in areas where the traditional financial systems aren't able to accommodate people. So in this case, in Mozambique, uh, mortgages, the interest rate for mortgages is about 25%. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want a 25% mortgage. Um, but despite the fact that the interest rate is so high, the biggest challenge is actually that most people aren't even eligible for a mortgage. And the reason being is that 80% is that of the population 
have informal income. So they don't have a formal employment contract they can take to a bank and say, this is my income, um, will you give me a loan? So the fact that they have informal income means that they are largely excluded from the financial system. So this video um, is just going to go into uh, giving you some information about the impact that this pilot has had. Um, will that sound play? Yeah. Without care or concern, without considering the impact our is having on housing, on human lives, and on the environment. Our country is facing a significant financial So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight as to, I guess, the, the real world impact that this project's having. So moving on, I guess, to talk some more about the, the technical implementation. Uh, so this is uh, some screenshots of uh, a part of our platform, which is called the Explorer, um, where people can obviously come in and they can navigate through some of the different NFT collections, the impact projects, and um, even if you were part of the pilot, you can come in here and you can actually claim rewards 
uh, from if you're one of the NFT holders, there are some rewards that come back to some of those NFT holders. Um, this is kind of a screenshot that shows you uh, what that looks like. And then obviously you can navigate through some of those NFT collections. Um, we've, we're uh, uh, about to soon be announcing that we'll be actually implementing our own ecosystem marketplace where people can actually trade some of those NFTs within our platform using our own token rather than using um, something like ADA. If you go to, normally you would have to go to somewhere like JPEG store, um, whereas this keeps it all within our own ecosystem using our own token so that you don't have to worry about having to trade in and out of that token. <coughs> so that basically took us to the end of 2022. We're now into 2023. Uh, we're in the depths of a bear market. Um, so we're starting to explore um, what is the best way to, uh, best direction to take this project. We've demonstrated through a pilot that we can actually achieve this, that we can connect finance uh, to people on the ground, we can work with partners. Um, we start to explore um, how we can scale this. And one of the uh, decisions that we made was the fact that we ultimately needed to make this desirable for institutions. Um, for the average individual person, we can obviously uh, talk to the, the impact and the feel good element of, of how you're helping people. Um, and obviously that's important to some institutions, certainly impact investors, um, but um, for the majority of, of investors, their, their primary focus is, is this a, a safe investment? Um, what kind of return am I gonna get? So we, uh, so we started building our institutional products uh, and part of that is actually um, being able to prove to the uh, investors that this is a safe investment, that the people who are um, paying for these homes are actually reliable payers. So we, we've uh, developed a, a product called Empower Pay and this is actually less community facing than the average person involved in the Empower ecosystem. It's more the people on the ground, so it's the, the housing partners and their clients. And so this is um, an application where they will actually record the payments that, the, the, that their clients are making so that we can actually track that um, and even report in real time back to the investors um, how that investment's going. Um, that's hopefully going to um, demonstrate to investors that this is um, not as risky as they might first perceive. Um, and it gives them real, uh, more real-time access to that data, whereas uh, other investment type um, products, quite often you have to wait 12 months to be able to get an audit of how that project's going. So this is kind of keeping that information flow more real-time. So this has been taking most of the focus for 2023. Uh, so there's obviously not been a lot of uh, community-facing announcements, other than obviously the fact that we've been head down working on our institutional product until recently. So here we come to the Cardano Summit um, of 2023 and we were fortunate to be selected by the Cardano Foundation to be the official NFT of the summit, which is fantastic. So uh, this is not uh, an NFT in the traditional sense of the Empower project where it's designed to uh, get, pay some kind of return to the holder. This is purely just a commemorative NFT um, it will be funding affordable housing, so we will be putting this into contributing to more homes in that Casa Real complex that you saw in the video. Um, but it is literally just a donation. Um, obviously, you get the NFT as well. Um, but we, we tried to make it a little bit fun, uh, a bit of fun, so we've actually created a collection of 30 NFTs, um, which is uh, the five different um, Cardano project phases, so if everybody's familiar with the phases of uh, Byron, Shelley, Gogan, Basho and Voltaire, they were defined by the, the, the Cardano project as the different uh, stages that the project needed to go through to fully realise everything that uh, Cardano wanted to achieve. And then we've combined that with six continents. We didn't include Antarctica as a continent, so we've only gone with six. Um, and so that's a, a collection of 30 NFTs. And if you collect all 30, then there's a special world NFT that you can mint if, because you become eligible. And it's been quite well received. Um, you know, we're literally 
what this is the, the official weekend of the summit, and I think we've sold 5,000 already. Um, and people are having fun posting on, on Twitter, you know, how much they've collected and, you know, where the gaps are in their collection. So um, would definitely suggest if anyone's interested in supporting um, and getting a, a summit um, NFT to commemorate coming today, then uh, jump on the uh, website there. So, all of that experience um, has now kind of led me to, uh, I guess, take a step back. One of the challenges that um, we had around um, building a team around the Empower project um, that is truly global, so uh, we have people in Europe, in Australia, in the UK, um, is that, uh, and obviously our um, uh, business is registered in, in, in the Seychelles in Africa, so um, doing any kind of uh, internal salaried payroll for, for staff is obviously extremely complicated. So all of our staff are um, contractors to Empower, including myself. Okay? So as part of that structure, what that meant was that I needed to build a team behind me that brought all this uh, experience that we've uh, developed building on Cardano, um, so developers and infrastructure um, uh, engineers um, to contribute to the project. So this is my, my own um, consulting business called Vaca Consulting, um, which I've built this team um, around to be able to contribute to the Empower project. So uh, just a little bit about who we have in the team. So we've got designers, software designers, um, UI UX designers, um, developers and DevOps engineers, and of course, all within the context of building on Cardano and having that experience that I've described across our entire journey of building the Empower project, um, the experience that we've gained in doing that. So building this team has meant that we can potentially um, offer our services out to more than just Empower, which is exactly what we've done. So here's a few of the other projects that we're building uh, or contributing towards. So uh, this is yet to launch officially. There is a website, but it's uh, yet to kind of make its presence known. Um, this is a, 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 a project called Amplify, which is essentially building on top of the World Mobile project, so offering um, services um, on top of the World Mobile project, um, including operating an Earth node, um, but also um, starting to invest in um, air nodes as well. Um, people might have seen uh, the Catalyst pitch that I did for, on Peach Channel uh, for the last Catalyst Fund uh, for a project called Climify. So this is a, a, a project uh, founded by a guy uh, named Yaron. Um, he's based out of Nairobi. Um, and this is um, more in relation to measuring the impact that projects have and um, tracking that impact using blockchain and um, potentially trying to monetize that impact um, and all geared around SDGs as a, a way to um, attribute that impact as well. And then obviously Empower um, is one of the, still our, one of our main uh, contributing projects. So what's next? So for me personally, um, I um, am quite interested in the governance era of the Cardano project. Uh, I'm quite keen to see if Australia can put its hand up and actually start to get actively involved in this part of the Cardano project and uh, start engaging in some of the discussions around uh, the SIP 1694 and the uh, proposed constitution that the Cardano um, project will be implementing next year. So I'll share some forums that maybe anyone who's interested in contributing to the uh, uh, governance discussions and how Australia can be part of the global conversation um, because I think this is obviously an important area. If we are building on Cardano, we want to ensure that um, our voice is heard in how that evolves over time. So obviously, being heavily involved in projects that are building on Cardano, I have a stake in ensuring that it continues to be the right fit for us. 
Um, and then obviously an offer to you guys if you have any uh, ideas that you would like to explore. Um, I'm obviously open to uh, contributing the experience that Vaca Consulting has uh, gained over the years, um, both with Empower and some of the other projects that we've recently started working with. So um, if you have anything, just a seed of an idea or a well-developed concept, um, and you need some uh, technical know-how to be able to help take it to the next step, then by all means, um, contact me. Uh, that's a link to my uh, LinkedIn, so if, uh, it's probably the best place to connect with me is on LinkedIn, and um, yeah, if there's anything that we can work on together, then I'm happy to have a, uh, have a discussion. And that's it. Any questions? Done. And my question is more to the actual implementation of Empower and the whole bus thing on the ground. Yep. So you've got people renting these houses to buy as such, which is great. That's going to the industry and, and you wouldn't see that change happening in those lives. I'm just wondering what happens on your way implementation to be with people are unable to make payments and they're left with no food and then the houses become stable. So the relationship between Empower and the houses is with the housing partner. So obviously contractually uh, the housing partner is responsible for paying back to Empower um, and it's ultimately up to them to manage their own clients. Um, obviously we have uh, tried to ensure that we're working with partners who can provide a rent to own model because we feel that's obviously a uh, a lower risk approach and also um, something that's more accessible to more people on the ground as well. So um, <clears throat> I certainly would like to think that um, the housing partners will be working with the clients to ensure that if they do fall into arrears, I guess like any um, tenant um, owner relationship that they'll work together to try and uh, resolve that problem. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, it's, it's still a business for them as well. You know, they've still got to be able to um, pay back their loan repayment back to Empower, and so um, we we can't we can't say to them that um, you've got to uh, keep that person in um, because it helps us feel better <laughs> the fact that that person hasn't got a roof over their head if it's damaging to their business. So um, ultimately we will work with the housing partner to um, manage the returns process if they are being impacted downstream by their own clients. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, we still don't want to have to impose on them how to operate their business. Excellent. Thank you.
no, no, no problem. And yeah, I mean, you're right. I think at the end of the day, um, it, if we can build this in such a way that it uh, demonstrates that um, that return is uh, not as risky as might, perceptions might suggest, um, hopefully the, the video message from Glenn there kind of just highlighted the fact that this is not a poverty problem. Um, these people are not poor. They can afford to pay for their houses. It is literally just a structural issue, the fact that um, whether it's through informal income or uh, high interest rates. So um, it's just a, about obviously effectively communicating that message and hopefully the data that we're collecting as part of the Empower Pay um, is going to help those more da data-driven investors. Um, obviously, the impact and the, the feel-good investors, um, <clears throat> the stories can obviously help a lot with that. But it, at the end of the day, collecting that hard data is um, going to get those um, that money that's on the side, as you said. Hello. Yeah, look, I mean, this is probably one of the most common questions we get is, is um, can we do this somewhere other than Africa? And absolutely. I mean, uh, we, we wanted to start where the problem was probably the most, uh, there the was the most need, uh, recognising that this is a global problem that, you know, every country, even so-called developed countries, are now starting to experience similar problems. So um, I think definitely, yes, we would certainly hope that we can expand our product into other jurisdictions and obviously shape it to fit the market because obviously not all markets are going to be the same. Um, and ultimately that's just going to be a time thing and um, as our products mature, our ability to adapt them into the appropriate markets will obviously be a lot easier to do over time. Um, so yeah, I mean certainly the underlying technology and the approach for how that's done. One of the things that I didn't talk about was um, one of the ways that we're actually transferring funds from Empower, where we're collecting the funds, into the housing partner. So one of the challenges that we actually experienced with working with Casa Real in Mozambique is um, this idea of a cross-border cross loan. And uh, from a legal perspective, um, all loans that are international uh, that goes into Mozambique have to go through the central bank. So, uh, and, they, and they dictate the interest rates. And we're like, well, that kind of defeats the, the point. You know, we're trying to make the interest rates uh, easier. Uh, so we, we had to come up with some new innovations as to how to do that. And we, uh, one of our um, lawyers actually came up with the idea of, um, if people might be familiar with Islamic finance, this idea of a double sale. Um, and so that's essentially what we've done. We, we, uh, the housing partner actually minted some tokens that we bought from them, and they're actually buying those tokens back to us over time as part of their repayments. So um, it's, it's working through the different challenges in different jurisdictions like that, that we obviously will need to 
take some time to kind of work through. Um, because, yeah, not everyone does everything the same. So, but yeah, um, as we kind of build out the technical infrastructure that supports different ways of moving money around, then I'm sure something like what you've described for Australia would be more than possible. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.